What about, yes. I think growing up, when we were kids out of school in our 20s, we could not even begin to imagine where our life has ultimately taken us, where our careers have ultimately taken us. Can you think of some of the most defining and memorable moments in your lifetime that really shaped who you are today and what ultimately affected where you took your career and how you went about doing it? It's hard to pinpoint particular moments. I have some. But you know, every experience creates a new reality. I'll be different from having been here today. Something will imprint itself on some cell in my brain and that'll lead open to some change of behavior or change of idea. So it's hard to know in a long stream of life which particular current carried you into a different direction. But in high school I was fortunate to have a series of English teachers, starting with Miss Hagen in the eighth grade, uh, to Miss Selma in the tenth grade, Miss Brutzi in the eleventh grade, Miss Hughes in the twelfth grade, first grade of college, uh, Eva Jo McKibben, uh, second uh, sophomore year in college, uh, uh, Mary Lou Brown. They all read aloud to us poetry. Maybe this is part of the question about about conversation and listening. Mm -hmm. And I remember falling in love with the beauty of language. Mm -hmm. As they as they as they read it. They were all most of them had been metaphorically widowed by the First World War. Remember I was in high school in the forties. So they would have married in the in, in, after in, in that earlier period, but most of the young men they would have married went off to war in, 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 in World War One. And they married college. I mean, they married teaching. That was their coupling. Uh, and they, their ability in that period to, to make us aware of the power of language uh, had a big influence on me. Uh, my brother worked for the newspaper. And he said to me one day, there's a job opening at the newspaper for a cub reporter. Why don't you apply? Uh, I was 16. I applied. Got it. That, you could say that was a defining moment. Uh, you know, obviously marrying the woman I married, who's been my wife for 57 years, is my partner as well, was a was a moment that changed my life. Uh, like everyone else, we've had very difficult issues, but but I uh, but we have been each other's tutor and each other's counselor and each other's friend, and that's been a big issue. Going to work for Lyndon Johnson when I was. 20 years old as an intern, not an intern, a student, summer employee, quite by coincidence, uh, changed my life. In those days, uh, politicians wrote letters. <laughs> now, the letters were usually written for them, and I went to work in his in his mail room. Summer, I was a soft, uh, I was between my sophomore and junior years in college. And I just sat down one April and wrote him a letter and said, "I'd like to learn something about politics. I want to be a political journalist." Letter came to his desk. It was well written. It's at the LBJ Library now. And he said wow. later it was a kind of presumptuous letter he would have written. And he liked it. And so he said, "Give this kid a job." And so I came up and went to work in his correspondence section. And I would write letter his answers to letters. And they, in those days, the letters were on the memory. You typed the letter. It was on a carbon, uh, and it went through to two other carbons, and it would say on there on the carbon LBJ colon. BDM, mm -hmm. the initials of the writer of the letter, and then colon, the secretary who typed it. So he kept getting these letters. He said, I like this letter. Who's doing these? He forgot I was there. <laughs> it was me. So he brought me over and set me outside of his office. Uh, he was Senate Majority Leader, just elected that year. And I wrote all of his letters to Eisenhower and Turkson and people like that. And he liked that. And so we bonded, and I came back to work for him many years later. And, uh, you know, that was a pivotal moment. I had gone to Washington. I didn't want to, he became vice president, and he was bored and I was bored. So I finagled <laughs> my way uh, out of his office to help set up the Peace Corps. I wanted to work, I wanted to help found the Peace Corps. I was standing in the cold January day out in front of the uh, lectern where, where JFK was giving his inaugural address because I'd worked in that campaign. And um, I heard him say, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country. And I knew at that very moment, I've written about this in my penultimate book, uh, Warriors on Democracy, 
uh, and I wanted to go help organize the Peace Corps. So I did. I, I managed to get away from Johnson and, 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 and go and help organize the Peace Corps. I worked for Sergeant Shriver. But, talk about fate, uh, ten days before JFK was going to Texas in 1963, to test the waters. He was going to run again in 64. It was said he wasn't popular in Texas. He wanted to go down there and test that, that polling. And, uh, but Texas was riveted by factions then. Ralph Yarbrough was a liberal senator and he had his faction. Lyndon Johnson was vice president. He had his faction. John Connolly was conservative government. He had his faction. Well, I got along with all of them. Don't ask me why, but I did. I was very young, but I got along with them. And so the phone rang one day in my Peace Corps office, and it was Kenneth O'Donnell, who was John Kennedy's political man. And he said, Bill, we want you to go. We sent an Italian uh, advance man to Texas, and he doesn't understand the language. <laughs> <laughs> and from Boston. And, you know, I had a way of, I liked the Boston Irish, and they liked me, and I, we were, I was sort of at the center of the Austin to Boston axis in that time. <laughs> so they said, J Jerry, who was a good friend of mine, Jerry Bruno, he just can't get along with these people. He can't figure it out the politics. Go down and hold their hands until the president gets out of, of the state after his last speech. So I did. I went to Austin. I saw all the factions, met with them, and, this, and the trip went well. Houston, a great success. Fort Worth, a great success. Austin was the last one on the trip, but he stopped. Maybe he was going to make a stop in, in Dallas. And, of course, he was assassinated. I was sitting in Austin at that time. Secret Service called me. I went out to the airport, chartered a small plane, was flown to Dallas, but the president died halfway between Dallas and, and, and Austin when I was over Waco. Landed at Love Field, looked out and saw Air Force One, and the policeman standing at the end, I said, is that the president's plane? He said, yes, and the vice president's just gone on it. So I went over and handed a note, wrote a note very quickly, to the Secret Service agent standing at the bottom of the ramp and said, uh, Mr. 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 President, I, I, he hadn't even been sworn in, but my mind shifted immediately, and I wrote, Mr. President, I'm here if you need me. So in a moment, the Secret Service agent motioned me up the ramp, and I went into the cabin, got there just before the federal judge who came to okay. swear him in. And in that famous picture of him taking the oath of office, if it's pulled back far enough, I'm standing over the office. <laughs> Mrs. Kennedy, Mrs. Johnson, the President. So I came back with him, went to his home that night, the vice president's home, and stayed those next four years. So if if Kenneth O'Donnell had decided he needed somebody who spoke Texan to go, or if I if Kennedy had actually I said no to him. I said to Ken O'Donnell, I can't. I'm with the Peace Corps, nonpartisan. I'm not in politics anymore. And uh, 30 minutes later, the phone rang. It was John Kennedy. He said, Bill, I hadn't talked to him since he was inaugurated. I said yes. He said. Kenny says, you don't want to go to Texas. I said, it's not that, Mr. President, but the Peace Corps ought to stay out of politics. He said, I'll tell you what, you go to Texas and worry about politics, and I'll stay in Washington and worry about the Peace Corps. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's another long-winded question, but it's, it's how does, how does your destiny get chosen yeah. for you? It's not a matter of character. Uh, it's a matter of coincidence. It's a matter of, you know, Shakespeare said, merit doth much. But fortune more? Mm -hmm. It is it is it is fortune. It is luck. Life's a lottery. And uh, it you know, it, it, it just happens. And it never hurts to speak Texan. <laughs> <laughs>